All right. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to uh, the Long Island Association, along with TLC VR, uh, brings you resiliency in the workplace. Uh, we have some really great guests that I'm really excited about uh, to introduce you to and um, explain uh, all about resiliency in the workplace and uh, how to bring it with a real life example uh, of it. So, um, second. Okay, we'll start now. All right, welcome everybody to uh, Long Island Association and TLC Virtual Resiliency uh, in the Workplace uh, program. We're really excited to be asked by the Long Island Association to present on what resiliency in the workplace is. And I'm really excited that we have two really special uh, guests to talk about it. First, let me introduce you to myself. My name is Robert Goldman. I am an, an attorney and a psychologist. I was a lawyer first and um, then went back to school, got my doctorate in psychology, where I became the supervising psychologist for Suffolk probation and the jails and for the county as the whole and working in the clinics as well as the jails. Uh, my passion now is really advocating for mental health by offering businesses uh, ways to practice resiliency both individually and the work and in the workplace. I'm really lucky to have um, Supervisor Rich Schaefer joining us and Dr. Michael Grudadoria. Um, I'm going to ask each one, Rich, if you could uh, introduce yourself from your perspective of um, your advocacy for mental health and Dr. Michael Grudadoria as well. So Rich, the floor is yours. Yeah, no, thanks, Rob, and it's good to be here today, and I appreciate what the Long Island Association is doing. Uh, my nickname at the Town of Babylon is the Therapist-in-Chief. Um, that is because I've kind of become known as, uh, I guess, an arbitrator, mediator, uh, someone who they use to parachute in when we've got either disputes or uh, any sort of uh, upheaval or upsetment uh, going on in various departments amongst uh, whether it be supervisor and uh, staff member or two staff members or a group of people. And so over the years, I've kind of adopted that role um, and got very interested when I had an, my own personal experience. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Um, about mental health and the impact that it has on uh, workplace. And so um, I've focused a lot on how can I make the place better for all of the staff members, because I know that my ultimate responsibility is to the constituents, the 220,000 or so residents who live in the town. And if the staff members who are assigned to providing services to them are in a good place, a good mental, or as we say, a good head space, um, that it's only gonna benefit the residents. And so it's kind of, I guess, the next generation of how to deal with everything we've gone through with COVID and how to deal with other uh, issues that have impacted your staff members. And that's why I'm excited to be part of this today because I think we can offer a lot of good information to business people, uh, people who are running various uh, sizes and types of businesses on Long Island uh, to give them a, another avenue to help uh, assist and make their companies even better. Yes, thank you, Rich. And you know, I, I've said this to you both personally and I will say it publicly as well, like Rich is really the champion for mental health and speaking out of it. And we, we need more leaders to understand the importance that mental health isn't just a one-time workshop. It really is a philosophy in the workplace. And you as a leader are a role model for uh, the value of taking care of yourself and most importantly, your mental health. So thank you, Rich, for all that you do. Um, Dr. Michael Grudadoria has taught me a lot about the uh, connection between the uh, mind and the body. Something as a psychologist, we... Uh, tend to ignore at, at the beginning of my training. I'm happy to report that it is uh, joining acceptability and notoriety in, in the field of psychology. But Dr. Michael Grudadori is somebody who is a great teacher 
and has taught me a lot about the importance of the interconnection between the biology and psychology. Dr. Mike? Hi, thank you so much, um, Dr. Goldman, and, and it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, again, my name is Mike Ridoria. I'm a chiropractor, a functional neurologist, and functional medicine doctor. I've been in practice clinically for 30 years. Um, about eight years ago, I had a patient call me and say, one of my best friend's sons is really struggling with depression. Can you see him? And I said, yeah, I'm sure, you know, we'll get him right in. And she said, no, can you see him today? And I said, sure. And what I realized was when this 23 year old young man came in was that emotionally, he was really quite stable. He was doing really, really well. He had a great support system. He graduated from college. He had a great job. He still had a wonderful relationship with his parents, but Every single day, he woke up with this overwhelming feeling of dread and had chronic suicidal ideation. And he was working with a psychologist and psychiatrist. He had been on multiple medications. And I said, something's not right. And we did blood, urine, stool, and genetic testing on this young man. And within three months, we totally turned him around and he was all better. Because the body affects the mind. The fact that we go to a, a neurologist for migraine headaches and a psychiatrist for anxiety is, is quite ridiculous to me. You know, we have, we, we look at things, you know, but both brain-based dysfunctions, migraine headaches and anxiety, yet we have doctors that are trained in two totally different ways of looking at the brain and treating it totally differently. You know, since then I've been working with literally hundreds and hundreds of people, um, you know, co-treating with, with Dr. Goldman and other psychologists um, in the field of mental health. And now I am the founder of the Functional Medicine Alliance for an international not-for-profit organization called Same Here Global, where I'm recruiting and developing doctors around the country who do similar things to what I do to team with psychologists to help people to rectify the physiological imbalances that they have due to lifestyle changes like diet and exercise and all these things and the stress and all these things, how they affect us, change the way we think and feel. So thank you so much for having me today. It's a real pleasure to be part of this panel. Thank you, Dr. Brutadoria. All right, so let's just talk, you know, we're doing this uh, for Long Island Association, honored to be asked, and we're doing it because May is Mental Health Awareness Month. And I'm kind of conflicted by the fact that we choose uh, a month. Uh, it's better than a day towards mental health. But I really think, you know, the problem is it's conceptualized solely as a month, but it's something that we need to tend to every day, you know? One of the greatest examples of prevention is um, brushing our teeth, right? Toothpaste. We don't do it once a month, right? It's not once a month uh, dentist uh, in June, we, we, our teeth would fall out. Mm. Same is true for mental health. I mean, I think that we need to raise awareness that, okay, we're, we're celebrating this this month, but we can't forget it all the, the 11 months throughout the year. It needs to be a daily work, a daily exercise. And the reason why I say that is because my philosophy is that wellness is an effort. Uh, I, I'm a blogger for Psychology Today, and one of my articles is, in, is titled Wellness is an Effort. And what I mean by that is that we are pre-wired to anticipate the worst because that helped us stay alive. And um, it was evolutionary to look towards the, the worst and anticipate the worst. We have not evolved to the extent that now we're looking towards the positive, even though that would be much more beneficial to our mental and physical health if we were more optimistic. We are still, our default mindset is to be negative. So if we acknowledge this, this changes the complete dialogue of what is okay and what's not in terms of normality, right? Because if it's normal to worry and to be anxious, abnormal is to not be anxious. And all of a sudden we really expand what the term norm normality means and expand those to which we have to reach and also expand going from a month to a way of life that we have to constantly tend to make sure we're not focusing on the negative, which is what our default mindset is. So I think when we hear people speak, 
what I talk about in the personal narrative, when it comes to in the workplace, when you have people who are leaders, who are bold enough to share their own stories of struggles and anxiety, it kind of says, oh, you know, I'm like everybody else. I am normal. Dr. Gurudori, do you want to speak with that at all? You know, it's you, you bring up a, a terrific point when it comes to the idea of, you know, danger and, um, you know, I'm OK. You know, we have this idea that one in five people suffers with mental illness. And that implies that four out of five are fine. Yet we all are dealing with stress. I mean, we live in a very stressful time in, in our country. Um, you know, we all have individual stresses at home and in our careers. And, and the reality is that that stress changes our neurology and our biochemistry. But we don't think about it that way. We just think about it as, oh, my God, I feel stressed. And what happens is over time, that stress is actually part of that. And you've, you've discussed this before, is it's actually there to help with survival. For instance, if you if, you know, for thousands of years, we were hunter gatherers walking around. And and uh, if we if we heard a bear in the woods, we would get that feeling of, oh, my goodness, like there's a bear there. Our brain would change and it would shift something in our body called the HPA axis which is you know, an area of the brain that controls our adrenaline system and our cortisol system and our adrenal glands and so on. That, that fight or flight mechanism is meant to be on less than 1% of the time. 99 plus percent of the time, our body's supposed to be in rest and digest mode. But in our society, we're in that fight or flight mode constantly because of the way we live. And as a result, it changes us chemically and neurologically and now we're when, what we call that, what we label that is anxiety. So, you know, is anxiety a disease or is it really just a series of dysfunctions that have happened as a result of chronic stress? And unless we understand how to reduce the physiological changes as well as handle these emotional challenges that we have, we're never going to feel better. And so, you know, I mean, you, you talk about it's okay to not be okay. I, I had a bad car accident when I was in graduate school and I, and I went through a windshield and after the head trauma and the neck injury healed about three months later, I had, I was driving and I had a full blown panic attack and that it persisted and it got worse and worse and worse. And now I'm at my doctor and I'm, I'm getting MRIs and getting all these things. And they said, I said, listen, I just had this massive head trauma. And they said, it has nothing to do with your head injury. You have, you have anxiety, you have OCD, you have depression. And I said, no, I don't have any of those things. I have a great life. And I suffered in silence because nobody believed me that this was a physical injury. And it was literally four or five years of dealing with this on a regular basis before I figured out that I needed to do neurological rehabilitation to make it better. And I, I just, it just bothers me that, you know, we have this, this frame of mind that, um, you know, that the stigma that you referred to that, you know, only certain number of people have these things, but we're all dealing with them all the time. Yeah. And, and I think the personal narrative is so important. Um, and, and, you know, the idea that you mentioned same here, uh, the concept being that same here, uh, Mike and I participated in uh, same here uh, day at uh, City Field, where athletes and people came together that, hey, we're all in this together. And, um, you know, Rich is somebody who shares his personal narrative. And I think, you know, when you hear leaders like Rich talk about it, you're like, it kind of allows you to take a deep breath and say, I'm not alone. Right. And, and that's, and you're right on. Look, after COVID, I, I, I start off any civic group or meeting with employees. Uh, tell me one person who you don't know who wasn't negatively impacted by COVID, whether it be the physical of COVID, but more importantly, the mental. And how many of us were afraid, not sure, uh, uh, having sleepless nights. And I kind of joke about it. And I, when I'm talking to people, I say, yeah, well, my therapist says I'm crazy. So, and it gets into the conversation of um, it's okay, like you say, to not be okay. And when you can talk about it, I, I experienced uh, something similar to what Dr. Mike described back in 2015, um, was depressed, uh, not eating properly, lost 30 pounds, which in my case might not be a bad thing. 
Um, but it, it, it didn't look good after I lost 30 pounds because it wasn't who I was. And I knew that there were a lot of issues and I was going to doctors to check out what was wrong and why I wasn't this and that. And it ended up where when I went to a new therapist, uh, she told me, she said, you've got a lot of issues, you know, that you need to talk through and work through uh, in order to get back on the horse. And so I spent probably a good, almost a year with her. She saved my life um, because there were times when um, I, at night and, you know, the mind plays crazy games on you that, um, that, uh, that I was not in a good state. And I was the town supervisor. I was a party chairman of the Democratic Party. I had a lot of, you know, people at me uh, and a lot of responsibilities. And yet I was also having to continue to deal with this issue. Um, and I opened up about it and talked to in public uh, gatherings. Uh, and I've had so many people come up to me and say, thank you for saying something because it's, I can't believe, you know, Rich Schaefer, the supervisor has this going on. I'm going through the same thing or my daughter's going through the same thing or my husband. Uh, and um, it's gotten, again, Pete, like I said, the, the joke is I'm the therapist in chief, but it's because I've been able to show the human side of a, lead, a local leader that we all go through it and it's okay. And it's best to talk about it instead of keeping it you know, wrapped up inside or going on like Dr. Mike described, the wild goose chase about what's really going on there. So that's why your philosophy, Rob, of, of making this every day has got to be because look, the strongest muscle in the body is the brain. I, you can argue the heart if you want, but I argue the brain is the strongest muscle because when that brain is not working properly, not firing on all cylinders or has been impacted because of stress and anxiety and all the things that like Dr. Mike says, change the neurological and chemical makeup of the body, uh, you're really off kilter and you're, you're gonna experience a really bad time that if you don't deal with it on a regular basis, and I say a daily basis, um, you're gonna end up in big trouble. So since we're all sharing, I will tell my story. I've had a lot of a lot of stories, but I think one of the most traumatic events in my life that really made me who I am today, and I think a positive way, was having a client die in jail right before sentencing. Ah. And um, I, you know, we as lawyers have that mindset to always look for a blame, and the first person I blamed was myself, and um, it. I had a hard time getting out of bed because I was seeing my clients who were in arraignments and were being arrested, but I would see my, that client's head who had passed on top of their body. So it was, I, I didn't know at the time, but I was suffering with a form of post um, traumatic stress disorder. Uh, it, it was really, really difficult for me that time. So and being a lawyer, you mentioned, Rich, about, you know, be, all, being a town uh, supervisor, the head of the Democratic Party, and then always feeling like you're under attack. Those things just feed into the, um, to the anxiety. Mm -hmm. So when it, it, and it's what we talk, what we'll talk about is the occupational mindset that comes with the position. So you were, you must have been in a, you know, a real tenuous place at that time. Really, really bad state. And in fact, uh, like I said, there was, there was just, it, 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 it displayed itself in so many ways. I literally couldn't leave the house for uh, probably about three weeks. Um, and of course, responsibilities continue, job continues. You've got to you know, adhere to what you need. And, and it really, uh, really was a jolt. And, um, but like I said, this woman, uh, Margie Sugarman, she's in Smithtown. Uh, she was referred to me by a good friend, Tony LaPinta, who I know, Rob, you know, he's a criminal defense attorney in, in Suffolk County, a good friend of mine from high school days. And uh, 
Tony sent me to her and, and, and Margie was, uh, her, her specialty is sports psychology where she works with high profile athletes uh, during their competitions and uh, seasons in order to keep them grounded. And um, interesting fun fact, I attend a gym where my trainer trains MMA fighters these crazy guys who go into a cage and look to beat each other up. And I've become the therapist in chief for the MMA fighters who have used Margie and, and, you know, being able to talk to her about uh, issues that they've had as a result of their competition, their losses, their wins. Yeah. Uh, they've all, they're all reading ego is the enemy. And, uh, <laughs> It's a kind of a comical thing. Uh, some of these guys have been in the UFC, retired, or are moving toward the UFC. So it's um, it's a fun kind of thing that I've been able to do with some of these younger guys to get them back on track. And uh, who would think? Who would have thought that you know this old guy is uh, is is preaching to these young guys and about their mental health? Um, yeah. when some of the toughest guys on the planet. So well. And you bring up a really good point. Like, so what I would, I would be overwhelmed. I couldn't, I couldn't step foot or want to fight anybody, right? That would be, you know, too stressful for me. And this is where stress is really subjective. You know, one person's stressor is another person's inspiration. Right. So you take like public speaking, take Rich like running for office, take uh, Mike for like, you know, trying a case. For some, that stress would be too overwhelming. For others, that would get you, rise you from a level of what we call homeostasis to optimal level of performance. And Dr. Mike, I'm wondering if, you know, one thing we talk about is our, you mentioned that our bodies are wired for acute, short burst of stress. But now we're, we are in a state, our society has put us in a state of chronic stress. And although we no longer fear the lion and tiger that's chasing us, social media, I think, you know, has replaced that and is our new predator. And the effects of chronic stress on the body, if you could explain how inflammation and stress are all related, I really appreciate it. So when, when our body goes into this fight or flight mode, one of the things that happens is we need to prepare for running or fighting. In order to do that, our nervous system shifts blood away from our intestinal system and into our muscles. Our, hearts, our heart rate increases, our breathing increases, our pupils dilate, and the body dumps sugar into the bloodstream for immediate energy. Well, that's, again, supposed to be only happening in very short bursts. But what happens if you're under chronic stress and your body is constantly dumping sugar into your bloodstream? And then you compound that with a high carbohydrate diet. Sugar acts like acid in the inside of our arteries, and it is linked to chronic inflammation. If you have ongoing stress and now you develop chronic inflammation, that is literally the seat for all chronic illness, cancer, diabetes, heart disease, depression, anxiety, all inflammatory disorders. So here we have this chronic stress. And again, we talk about it as a mental and emotional thing, but it's absolutely a physiological thing that leads to chronic illness and early death. So that's how important it is to come up with stress management programs and lifestyle modifications in order to keep people well. And we also see that, you know, stress hits the workplace, right? How it impacts the workplace is, um, 62 percent of workers say that their job is their main source of stress. So there's something inherent with their workplace, which is where they spend a good percentage of their time, uh, where they're reporting high levels of stress within the workplace. And Rich, I'm just wondering if you could speak to the um, how that contributes to you as a town supervisor and the workers that work for the town of Babylon, how, how sure. you see uh, stress impact um, the ability to, to serve the constituents in the town of Babylon. You know, that's, and, and again, that's, uh, we had Superstorm Sandy where 
all of our staff had to literally uh, remake their roles and be able to get 10,000 homes back online, uh, families that were associated with those homes. That brought a lot of stress on uh, winter storms, COVID re most recently, uh, and even just the daily average, you know, dealing with sometimes you deal with some very unreasonable people, but you can't express that to them. You've got to help de-escalate and put them in a better headspace themselves so that you can serve them properly. Uh, as an elected official, I would be one of those 62% <laughs> saying that stress exists uh, pretty much all the time because, and you mentioned social media. Uh, I was town supervisor in the 90s when we didn't have social media and we waited for letters to show up or the phone to ring, not even a cell phone, not even a smartphone uh, in order to accept complaints or concerns or questions. Now uh, we're literally 24 seven because people are sending you messages through Instagram and Facebook and text messages and emails. And how come you didn't respond to the email I sent? Well, you just spent, you sent it about 45 minutes ago and I happened to be doing something else at the time. And so all of that compounds itself, which, and, and that goes for any staff members who are in a public service role. And so we, I would say if I did a survey of the town of Babylon employees and, you know, we've got probably between part-time and full-time and uh, seasonal over a thousand employees, um, I bet you that number would be around there or maybe even higher because of, especially the last two years about what we've gone through and how we've had to adapt to providing services under some, you know, very dangerous conditions. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's definitely what has driven me to what we're going to talk about a little bit later is that we've got to do something so we don't have an epidemic on our hands and people not being able to respond uh, health, healthy in a healthy, rational, professional fashion. Yeah. And, you know, I would say, Rich, in working with the town of Babylon, I have learned so much about the obligations and the high burden that you know, town workers have in serving um, the residents that, you know, and some things you're prepared for and other things you're not like COVID. And right. the, you know, it's a test of resiliency. How strong a foundation do you have so that you're prepared, right? I mean, it is taking, uh, when you le lose an employee, this is the, um, the bottom line, right? You know, a lot of business leaders are, are most focused on, well, what's my return on investment? How much am I going to lose if I don't tend to my employees' uh, mental health to, to avoid them from feeling burnt out or other mental health struggles? And according to the research, as you can see, for a uh, 50000 salary, it costs about 16000 to replace. And I don't believe that includes training. A uh, hundred thousand salary cost thirty three thousand, which maybe you could speak to what it is to lose an employee who's been there for years and has great institutional knowledge uh, of the town of Babylon and understands the ins and outs of the waterways, the the ground, and all of that. How much you lose when you lose an employee that has that? Yeah, we have we have a couple of employees who have. Um, 30 years, 35 years of experience or literally, you know, encyclopedias of, of their job. And uh, we have a policy that based on what they do, what type of position they're in, we'll bring someone in up to a year ahead of time to have them shadow or work under the person that they're replacing. We had a plans examiner who was with us a long time and to lose her was a big jolt. And, uh, but we had brought somebody in six months prior and still that person wasn't up to speed on what uh, he needed to do to replace her. And uh, so it's a big, it's a big cost in terms of that, like you said, institutional knowledge. Um, and it's also uh, a big cost for, 
uh, kind of the motivation for some of the younger people because the younger people who come in will train under the long time serving. So it does it does cost when you have them leaving. Um, and I would say that uh, it's important to to get them replaced with someone who's been under them for a while. Additional cost to the town, but it's important to do. And I you think know, I'd like to go ahead, Dr. Mike. I'm sorry, I'd like to jump in um, just to add to that. You know, we're talking about the cost to replace. What does it cost to have somebody working at 50% of their capacity? You know, what does it cost to have half your workforce functioning at 50 to 60 to 75% of their capacity because they're overstressed, they're not physically well, they're taking time off from work because of the stress and physical limitations that they have because they're out of shape or their body's not working well. So, I mean, you know, investing in the organization, you know, the, the, the key to your, to your whole, the reason why we have organizations is the people. And, you know, we, we usually kind of, we've taken that for granted. And we usually think like, if you're not sick, then you're well, and, and they couldn't be farther from the truth. So, you know, when you think about losing an employee, you know, and of course you're $33,000, but at the same time, you know, what is it what is it costing every organization to have employees that are just not well you know it's a, it's it's ridiculous and you know i think mike that's a great example of the great resignation where people would just kind of it's a reprioritization of what mattered and people started you know there are a lot of reasons why people left um the major, you know, one thing I find interesting is from a recent article, which said that the majority of workers who quit in 2021 cited low pay, no opportunities for advancement and feeling disrespected. So there, there, there's a lot of debate as to why we're experiencing the great re resignation, but it's going on. It's definitely happening. You know, um, do, are you noticing it, Rich, at all? Did you experience? Um, I, I have had. Uh, not, I wouldn't say it's been a massive um, leap, but I, I would say that in, in talking to individual employees, some have sped up their retirement uh, based on what went on during COVID. Uh, life's too short kind of comment. Right. I want to enjoy it. We did have an employee, sadly, a uh, longtime employee who had just announced his retirement. We were about to celebrate him and he got COVID and passed away. Um, and he was young, he was, I think 59, um, had been one of our longtime uh, highway department employees, uh, dispatcher. And uh, it kind of shook a lot of people that worked with him and a couple of them rethought their, uh, their uh, retirement and, uh, and left. So yeah, we didn't have many that were changing jobs or moving along like that, but it mostly was at the kind of the tail end of where people were at. And maybe they would have stuck around for a couple more years, but decided that it was time to enjoy the retirement that they had worked so hard to uh, get to. And, and I think part of the reason is also, you know, and I think you touched upon it, Rich, is a reprioritization of what mattered most. And when people were working from home, some of them saw what they were missing. Right. And, and what was valued and what was important. So really now you're talking about a generation that wants better work-life balance, you know, for what, you know, people, they're advocating for more programs like the one we're going to talk about. They're valuing me mental health. And they want to see it not just outside of work, but taking place within the workplace culture. And this is a generation that values boundary setting, um, saying no, don't call me at ten o'clock at night. You know, I have I have things that I have to do, and this is what matters most. Right? We're seeing that shift, and and I and I think that's it's important that that we as leaders and businesses listen to that shift and acknowledge it. Because if we don't, we're gonna continue losing good people because other places are gonna offer something like this, right? Oh, absolutely. And I and it's what I've heard in the town. I mean, some people did say, oh, why are you focusing on this? Some of the old, old timers, um, but you're right about the generational 
the younger employees have embraced it and were like, you know, what took you so long, old man, to put this uh, in place? So yeah, you're you're you are right in terms of what I've witnessed uh, amongst our own group in the town of Babylon. But it's going to take a shift, like someone like you, Rich, that's going to be an ambassador and a leader of wellness and value it more than just the bottom line of the economics, because the economics is not felt till later. But mm -hmm. you know, it, there needs to be more people like you in the business community that say, you know, a one-time seminar on resiliency or mental wellness is not does not do it. No, it's got to be, it's, I call it retraining the brain. Uh, and it's something I do with, uh, work with some uh, people who participate in our drug and alcohol program called Beacon Family Wellness Center. And when I'm working with an individual, I, 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 I literally tell him or her that you, we've got to retrain your brain. Your brain set out a path to, you know, use drugs and be addicted uh, cause you to blow yourself up pretty much. And we've got to retrain your brain. And, and the same has to go for like what Dr. Mike is saying, uh, talking about uh, changing your lifestyle. So you've got to, you've got to retrain your brain to not want to eat at nine o'clock at night or to eat bad food, as opposed to making your own food. You know, it, it's just got to be kind of a cultural shift. And that's got to be something that occurs every day, because if you make someone sit in a room and listen to a presentation and think that that's going to solve it. It's literally, how do you retrain something? Well, if you've taught uh, somebody a bad habit and say a wrestler, a bad move, uh, you've got to make him or her go back over it again a thousand times. Oh right. yeah. They made, they made me do that move a thousand times, right? Or a pitcher. Uh, yeah, I'm using sports analogies, but if a pitcher learns a bad uh, pitch, uh, you've got to get his or her mechanics retrained so that they do the pitch the way it's supposed to be done. Um, same goes for your lifestyle uh, and your wellness, as you say, the well, the wellness category. So that's why we introduced the program we did, because I told everybody it's got to be something that you constantly are working on in order to get yourself better, make yourself better. Yeah, you speak, you mentioned something um, that in the, in the field of neurology and Dr. Mike, you can speak to this, neurons that um, fire together, wire together, you know, and habits of the mind are hard to break, right? So um, you wanna to speak to that, Dr. Mike? Yeah, I mean, we know that there's this something called long-term potentiation, which means that the brain can change and grow and adapt for our entire lives. You know, we know that we can have an 85 year old stroke patient, for instance, who loses function in an arm. And, you know, within a year of aggressive rehabilitation, we can regain function in that arm, even though the area was, was actually damaged. So if we can rehabilitate, a, you know, a, a somebody, an 85 year old person who's had brain damage, you know, what is the real capacity of the brain to, to heal and to, and to modify and grow? It all depends on what we're doing for it. And, you know, I'll just give you like a, a real simple explanation. When we talk about wellness and, and, you know, you've mentioned multiple times that wellness is a process. Wellness is a mindset. It takes up to 20 years before somebody finds out that they have dementia. So literally the day that they have that first symptom of, you know, where's my car parked? They've had this for 20 years. And so, you know, health is not the absence of disease. It's an ongoing process that we need to be aware of. And I'll give you an example. Let's say you're 50 years old and every single day for the past 50 years, you have an oven and you cook the giant roast beef in the oven without, without a cover on the, on the top of the on the top of the pan. And it's as the oven is, is cooking the roast, it's splattering all over the inside of the oven. And for 50 years, you never ever clean the oven. After 50 years, the inside of the oven would be caked with all kinds of grease and grime and waste that got all over the oven because you never cleaned it. Well, that's actually what's going on inside of us all the time. Every time we burn food, then create energy, we create waste. And the, the waste comes in many different forms, but it builds up in our body. 
our body has a self-cleaning button, just like usually ovens at this point have a self-cleaning oven. So every couple of weeks, you hit that self-clean, it burns off all that gunk on the inside of the oven, it looks brand new. Our body has that same thing. It's called the process of autophagy. The problem is that we never kick it in because it only kicks in when we're exercising and when we're fasting. We have this built-in mechanism that says, hey, we're going to clean out your body and your brain, but we never, ever use it because of our lifestyle. We're not meant to eat three to five times every day. We made that up. In nature, animals feed and fast all the time. A, a tiger can eat today and not eat again for five days. And that's by design. In religion, we fast. You know, We have different days of fasting to purify the mind and the body. That's, that's physiological as well as emotional and mental and religious. So there are so many things that we can be doing to become more resilient that we need to be you know, really imparting on a regular basis. The problem is we're just not taught this way. We're taught that when you're feeling good, you don't need to go to the doctor. When you feel sick, you go to the doctor. Usually you get, you know, you get something to deal with the symptoms you're dealing with and the doctor implies come back when you're sick again. And that's just not wellness. Well, yeah, that's a sickness model, right? And, and, and that brings me, you know, resiliency is, is focused on prevention and everything, the word resiliency, everyone was talking about when COVID hit in sports in approach to the pandemic, wherever you watch any show and the word resiliency pops up, you know, and we talked about how resiliency um, becomes more of a word that people, it's a, it's positive psychology. It's less stigmatizing. And I think that's one of the reasons why it's so acceptable is as people are talking about mental health, they can digest, you know, pun intended, the word resiliency more. Um, it's in packaging. And I don't really care what words we use as long as we're tending to our wellness. And we don't, we can't assume that it just comes naturally. We have to make sure we tend to it. And why zebras don't get ulcers is what you spoke about before, Dr. Mike, is that zebras either uh, escape or get eaten. There is no state of chronic stress. And we have to make sure that we are constantly making the effort that we take care of ourselves and that you know, resiliency is really a philosophy. And that, as I said, a one-time seminar about workplace wellness does not create a culture of resiliency, which really needs to um, focus on prevention as opposed to crisis management. Like you can tell how resilient a business or a company is by how it responds to um, stress, right? You know, there's individual resiliency and there is business resiliency. And we're gonna talk about how they overlap. But, you know, Rich spoke about it before. Rich, when a storm hits, one thing I really learned uh, from the town of Babylon and working with Tom Stay, when you get a warning that a storm is about to hit, you don't wait, right? There's conscious, there's, conscious attention to storm tracking, to making sure that, you know, the snow plows are going to work, that they're fueled up. I learned a lot that you have all the salt, right? Like a lot goes into this to oh, prepare. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's usually three or four days ahead, depending on the size of the storm. Um, you know, go back to Sandy, which was obviously a very unique situation, but it was preparing like that, then having the experience and literally, you know, a couple of years of response, the immediate aftermath, probably six months. Um, but it was, uh, you yeah, know, it was quite, quite a thing. And any of these typical winter storms or even crazy hurricanes or uh, tornadoes or whatever, whatever else occurs here, weird wind storms that wipe out West Babylon had a whole crazy windstorm and it took down almost every tree. And it took us like two, two and a half months to clean up from that. And that was a big stress. Um, so yeah, we're, we're constantly on, on alert with uh, those. And we use the word resiliency to show Pat 
pat our employees on the back that you're resilient, you're able to go out there and be resilient and it gets them uh, mo more motivated and, and makes it e a little bit easier. Right. But imagine if we put as much effort into preparation of storms as we did for uh, physical and mental disease. Imagine like, you know, if we focused on working out and our mental health tending to that, preparing ourselves for being the best that we can be. Dr. Mm -hmm. Mike talks about being optimal in how you perform. We're, we're okay with mediocrity, but we, do, we don't really try to be at an optimal level, right? Absolutely. Um, and, and that's why it's important to introduce it almost every day. Yeah. So how do you assess resiliency in the workplace? My definition is a resilient workplace is one that facilitates individual resiliency within the environment so that employees are able to reach their true potential, thereby making the business itself resilient, right? So if we tend to our employees' overall resiliency, we can make sure that our uh, the company is being as resilient as possible. And I divided this up into different factors. So first, let's talk about individual resiliency. Um, uh, mastery, self-efficacy, optimism. You know, optimism is one of the biggest contributing factors to being resilient. Somebody who is optimistic, the research is filled with examples of when you have an optimistic attitude, your prognosis for both physical and mental health is that much greater, right? So how do you balance being optimistic and at the same time anticipating things that might happen? And we're gonna talk about that. The other, the other thing that's so important with resiliency is connection, social support, right? So the, people who are able to have connections, to lean on people, to, to have others have their back is so tied to resiliency. And, and one area that is somewhat neglected, I mean, exercise is key, but Dr. Mike, can you speak a little bit about the, the brain gut connection? Because that's, a, that's an area that in my opinion is often neglected. So I have a 26 year old son and when he was little, he used to get ear infections all the time. After a while, my wife would literally just call the pediatrician and they would just call in antibiotics over the phone without even seeing him. Because it used to be thought that all bacteria was bad and killing bacteria is good. And it, it gave rise to the idea that we should have antibacterial soap and we should spray Lysol on everything. And we should have you know all these different gels that we rub our hands with all the time. And what it's led to is you know this antiseptic ideology as it turns out, a study was done not too long ago. It's called the Human Microbiome Project, where they mapped every bacteria that lives in and on us. And what they found was startling. It turns out that we're actually one-tenth human and nine-tenths bacteria. We have 10 times the number of bacterial cells in our body than we have human cells. So we have this giant colony, about three pounds of bacteria that lives inside of our large intestine that we realized controls our metabolism. It is totally interfacing with our immune system. It's interfacing with our brain and runs our cognition and our emotion. Studies have been done that show that people with an abnormal, they call it the microbiome, this collection of bacteria, abnormal microbiome had a terrible, terrible outcomes with COVID. So gut function equals immune function. And yet we have so many people that have so many chronic, what we call functional gastrointestinal disorders, whether it be indigestion or diarrhea, constipation, irritable bowel syndrome, bloating, pain in their abdomen, all of these things are functional GI issues that we just treat with over-the-counter medications constantly. As it turns out, we're damaging this microbiome, and this plays a gigantic role in how we think and feel. The gut-brain connection is hardwired because we have this, you know, the way that the brain controls the gut is through something called a vagus nerve in the parasympathetic system. But we know that there's a direct corresponding relationship between the gut and the brain. So it's not only the bacterial colony, the microbiome that's communicating with the brain, it's neurologically through the vagus nerve, and it's through different peptides and, and chemical hormones and, and, um, and these different things like chemokines and so on that transmit from the gut to the brain. 
So how your gut works really determines how well your brain works. And, and what I find really interesting is 95% of the serotonin um, is made in the gut. And serotonin yep. is um, a neurotransmitter that is responsible for um, depression and uh, higher levels of serotonin has been demonstrated to be linked with, you know, those who don't have as much depression or, you know, so it's really interesting. And I'm so grateful, you know, this is what we're talking about, taking an eclectic view of mental health and, you know, talking about it from a um, mind body thoughts and connections and really attacking anxiety uh, uh, on a full frontal attack, you know, not just one piece, but every piece. It's so vitally important. You know, the other thing I want to talk about is how in trauma, the body keeps the score and how, you know, when we're affected, like Dr. Mike, you talked about, you know, your car accident, trauma is stored. The research shows that trauma is stored neurologically in the body. And it, when we struggle with anxiety and things like that, it could be from prior traumatic experience that is energy that's stored in the body. There's a book called The Body Keeps the Score that is um, very well, um, in my opinion, very well written and very popular in the field of the mind-body connection. So when we, when TLC Virtual Resiliency, the way we compartmentalize or view um, resiliency education is that we, we, we venture and we go from off in the fear zone. If we look at COVID-19, everybody felt disconnected, isolated, sad, and depressed. But then when you start learning, when you start becoming more open-minded to the eclectic need to attack anxiety, for example, we become educated, we grow, and then we can start um, engaging in healthy habits that really address um, our anxiety and our fear zone, and then we become more empowered. So education is really the key to growth and attacking anxiety. Well, the, one of the problems in our society is what we're, we fear anxiety. And when anxiety hits us, we try to insulate ourselves and avoid the stressor. But we have to face our fear and become educated by it and not allow us to control us because if we do, we'll be stuck in the fear zone and never be able to grow. So it's really important that we educate ourselves constantly, constantly. The problem is that we've been educated. A lot of our, you know, a, a lot of our occupations, whatever it is, we can look at doctors, lawyers, healthcare professionals, civil servants, people who work with the community. There are certain mindset hazards that we learn in our education or as we start a job that it, we have to be the catastrophizer. Like we have to think worst case scenario, right? We have to be hypervigilant on guard for the next storm. We have to be perfect. We can't make a mistake and we have to really be an advocate for you know our clients as an attorney. Concrete thinker, we have to think black and white. When you're an officer, a correction officer, you have to not look to the humanity of uh, an inmate right away. You have to react. There is no time to think in the grays. The rescuer, a lot of people who are social in, engaged in helping people feel the, <laughs> feel the burden of having to rescue everyone, the know-it-all, the person who feels like they need to know everything. They, they can't allow um, anybody else's opinion to you know, infiltrate because they need to know everything. And then the boss. Now, all of these things are hazards that come with the work and may help them in their job at, in, you know, at the moment, but it undermines the resiliency, the individual factors related to resiliency, such as optimism. All of, I mean, if we just look at optimism, that's, all these things are gonna destroy the resiliency that a person comes with at work. And we can't ignore it, right? Rich, is there any of these things that you can relate to, these mindsets? Oh, God, I'm the rescuer. I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm the one who thinks I'm going to solve, you know, solve everybody's problems and 
you take you take that on to yourself and uh yeah oh god the rescuer the perfectionist the hyper vigilant yeah I've, i'm about like four of the eight so <laughs> Uh, and that's a lot of stress being put on. And, you know, and I have, I can go through my top, the top staff in the town and, and tell you who is, who is in each category there. I, this is like dead spot on. And Rob, it's, uh, it's a lot of what you taught us. You know, we, we were fortunate to have um, you and your team from TLC uh, during COVID. And I, you and I talked about this Um and I needed to get somebody in, not me talking to them, but outside views to educate them, to, to, to help them process this COVID pandemic, to get back on the horse, to be able to help others. And I had a couple of resistors, you know this, I won't name names, but by the end of it, after you and your team got done kind of educating us, you know, kind of calming us down, bringing us to like reality that those resistors, uh, you know, wow, we don't need to listen to them. Wow. Could I have this for my, you know, foreman? Could I have this for my, for my under supervisors? Could I have this? And, and everybody was really grateful to, like you said, to be able to kind of pop outside of whatever category they were in and be able to speak from uh, an edu educated standpoint to be able to calm not only their own anxiety down, but others around them. And, and that's just it. So, you know, it's so hard because here we're talking about being uh, individually resilient, but we're learning- well, nobody likes to show vulnerability. No, that's the key, Rich. Well, well, every, and, and this is what I, you know, I just, I'm working with a kid right now and uh, I, I did this, my a friend of mine was uh, the assistant coach of the Hofstra wrestling team. So they're a division one team. They're functioning at a higher level. And he and I came up with this pro. So anyway, short story is I've got about probably eight of the Hofstra wrestlers in various capacities that I've been working with. And one of them in particular, because wrestlers are taught to be tough guys. And, and again, it could be the UFC fighters the same way. And I said, it's, it's stronger for you to be able to show your vulnerabilities, to be able to deal with how to process them and make you even stronger. You're, you've got to have an edge on the guy or gal you're going up against, right? Uh, in fact, there's a young woman who's a UFC fighter, uh, Jillian. She just won her fight last week. But she and I, and she and I had this conversation about how um, how – Everyone wants to have an edge on their opponent. So you could be better in cardio, better in strength, get it better in taking down. And she and I agree. And, and she reported it. I said, yeah, but the other edge you can have is be better in the moment. And we're getting all the fighters to buy into it. And same thing, show your vulnerability. It's okay to talk about what you're afraid of what you're not sure of and that's part of what you've done for us tlc is to talk about your vulnerabilities yeah and i think that's so important and brings you back to the personal narrative Be, being vulnerable is so important because only if you acknowledge the vulnerabilities can you work on them and be stronger right so it's so it's so important. Okay, so in addition to the occupational uh, mindset hazards, you also have, you know, the workplace settings, right? The workplace settings, which really uh, can undermine your uh, resiliency by creating a culture where employees feel they lack independence, competence, and connection to the job. Right. So when people work in an environment where they feel that um, they don't have any type of autonomy um, or connection to what they work or lack competency, all they're doing is really working for the weekend. Right. Do you remember back in the day, WBAB used to sing, everybody's working for the weekend. Right. I don't sing. Sorry. But 
the point is you want intrinsic motivation. You want people to show up at work, intrinsic motivation, not just for the pay, but because they value what they do. So self-determination is another part of how we assess intrinsic motivation and are we facilitating resiliency? So a place that facilitates autonomy, competency and relatedness. Rich has um, the landfill and the guys at the landfill call themselves the Green Berets. And that's because they take pride in what they do. They feel related to it. All these things need to fire together in order to facilitate resiliency within your employees, thereby making your place of work really resilient, really resilient. So the other piece, in addition to self-determination theory of competency, autonomy, and relatedness, your employees need to feel psychologically safe. That is, they feel that their opinion matters and they won't be in fear of being struck down by having input in what they have to say. And you can see how psychological safety relates to the self-determination theory of uh, relatedness, autonomy, um, as well as feeling that they are, you know, connected and competent at what they do, right? So Rich, you just don't, it's important, right? That when you have employees, you just don't have them as soldiers, but they feel that they're part of a community participating and feeling like their voice matters. Yeah, we, we call it the town of Babylon family. And we say that we've all grown up in dysfunctional families uh, and we figure out how to make it functional. So uh, it, it, it's all about you know, treating people as people instead of like you say, uh, robots or, you know, just that they're coming here to provide a service. You, you, every person who comes before you is coming in with whatever's going on at home, whatever's gone on in their past, whatever experiences they've had, and you got to treat them as people. So that's my philosophy on how I manage and how I ask the managers that work with me to manage the same thing that everybody's got to feel um, look, it's the old adage. I'm not, I'm not going to ask anyone to do something that I wouldn't do. Um, and so you have to have the same, uh, ability to have the same experiences and to show them. So whether you're a laborer or a secretary or a janitor, that you're as valuable because without you, the team doesn't accomplish what it's supposed to accomplish. And I make fun of the commissioners or the, you know, call them the, you know, the fat heads and say, I'm, I'm more reliant on, you know, Brandon, the, the uh, custodian than I am on you because without Brandon's work during COVID, we wouldn't have been able to keep the buildings open or, or be able to provide the services. So it's, it's all about showing everybody that they're all on a, a pretty much equal level in terms of being part of the family. Obviously right. there's a you know, a pecking order and, and what you have to do in terms of orders and stuff, but showing everybody that they can participate safely without fear of retribution. Uh, their uh, comments are going to be taken seriously and we've got to all uh, work together to come up with the, the best, um, the best, uh, uh, putting the best team out on the field to accomplish what we need to on behalf of our residents. And, you know, it's, and the research that uh, I quote here that was done by Google said that the the more psychological safety, the 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 higher the performing team. So the more that teams feel that they their their opinion value uh, matters and that they can have valued input and that they share an aligned mission, increases the performance of that team, and that makes sense. Now speaking of good, I, Rich, did you want to add? No. Okay. But, you know, speaking of what makes sense, I want you to, if you could talk really, because you're the prototype, you know, you are the ambassador, you are someone who obviously really gets the need for health and wellness in the, in the job. And I find it somewhat interesting and somewhat ironic that somebody who's not in the private sector, right, who's not in the big business arena, but still has the common sense to bring it to 
um, uh, you know, the the social service uh, community, I think, speaks to you. And it's so oh, thanks. I appreciate it. It's so uh, courageous. So could you talk a little bit about the the program? The, sure. the program yeah, we, at Babylon? In fact, we were talking about it uh, even before COVID. Uh, with a couple of people who had some interest in the various, uh, and then once COVID hit, uh, and we hired a company called Radish to help us track our employees' uh, uh, health conditions to be able to provide for um, quick uh, COVID tests and and you know make us uh, make us functional, um, and then I we added you into the mix uh, about the mental health, which has been one of my big things to talk about since my own personal experiences and, and other experiences I've had in the community. Um, and we said, why can't we, you know, Northwell um, does a health and wellness program. And some, some of these larger companies have incorporated it into, like you said, you mentioned in Google or, you know, some of the well-known companies, but I said, what, why are, why should government employees or, you know, public service servants, be treated any differently. They're people just like the people who work at Google. So we said, um, and we talked to you know some of the employees. The unions were kind of, kind of thrown off because uh, we were actually offering this to our employees uh, free of charge, and we were also offering where we were taking two hours a week on town time, incorporated that in to what people can do in order to get them to want to do it. So Dr. Mike is providing great lectures and um, information sessions. I attended one of his and uh, I know he had one a few days ago where people are, are really talking about it. It was about uh, nutrition and mood or food and mood. And uh, they're, they're giving me very positive feedback about things that they learned there. And a lot of times it's simple things that you have probably heard when you were in seventh grade health class but uh, in real life, you haven't adapted it to your real life. So we've got that in terms of, and we've got nutritionists that are available to consult with our individual employees on their own specific personal plans. Radish Health has continued where we've got Radish on board. They do annual physicals. I had a couple of guys in DPW come up to me, you know, so, uh, what is all that? They came back to me and said, I schedule my physical, you know, I got this, I got that, I'm gonna get this checked out you know, this is worth it, Schaefer. And, and, and they're like, you know, they were like, you know, resistant. I'm not, there's nothing wrong with me. I, and probably they do the same thing to their wife when she says, go to the doctor and get a checkup. And so now we've made it easy where they can do it right there. Um, and they've got virtual doctor available. We then took the mental health aspect where we've utilized your team uh, in various situations, uh, department, situations, individual uh, settings where people want a one-on-one -on -one discussion. And probably the best thing that we've done is we've getting everybody moving. Um, so we've got a strength and conditioning uh, aspect. Rob Labiento, who is our health and wellness director, uh, someone I've known for probably 15 years since he was a, a, a kid out of high school, um, pursues now pursues his dream of being a health and wellness uh, director where he's able to show people how to move how to um, create strength um, through cardio and conditioning and um, core work uh, and we're talking about people who haven't moved in years uh, whether because they sit behind a desk or they're behind a computer or they are moving in weird ways because they're out on a climbing up a pole to you know uh, check a street light or they're, they're doing all this. So he's got, and again, uh, they were making fun of me when I was going around department to department um, explaining this whole program to them. And I had Rob, I had someone from Radish there. And I said, guys, you're gonna, you know, and, and gals, you're gonna love this. And they went, oh, now this is, come on, stop this. I, and now they're getting into it and they're like, holy, I'm, I'm watching what I eat. Me and my coworkers, uh, the town clerk's office, Jerry Compatello, who's our town clerk, I'm a big proponent of this. She says, Rich, I've tracked our productivity. 
Um, our productivity has increased. I've been able to reduce my overtime and the women, she's got mostly women, she's got a couple of guys in there, but she says the women have lost collectively 150 pounds since we started this in January. We're sharing recipes, we're doing this. So it's become, like you said, this mindset. Um, and even in DPW, they're all salty guys. Ah, uh, we're going to go to the yoga class next week. Uh, I said, yeah, I can't wait to see you guys in yoga or, uh, attire. And, uh, uh, but they're saying, no, but it's teaching us how to move better. Our workers' comp plan has, um, what is it called? Our rating has increased whereby we're do, we've, ent, we've uh, put this program in place so we're less likely to have injuries because we're teaching our DPW, our landfill, our blue collar, you know, guys that are, you know, sometimes they're moving, you know, 100 pound things and they may wrench their back or something. So we're, we're doing all that. So the, the guy that handles our insurance said, this is wonderful because we've now been able to reduce some of your workers' comp insurance costs because your rating is better because you're providing this program and you're letting them stretch and you're doing all this stuff um, uh, before they start working. Uh, so I know I went on a little too long there, but why I'm so excited about it is because we finally launched it this January. We were talking about it for a long time and I'm excited. We're almost at the six month point where we're going to sit down and kind of review where we're at to see where we need to make tweaks to respond to what people want to see as part of the program. But the best part is I had people come up to me and say, I went out and joined at my gym. I went out and I'm riding my bike with my son. I'm, I'm doing like this. They're like, you're seeing the change of the mindset. Is this 100% of our staff? No, but the first week it started with like 70 people participating. And now in some various capacity, we've got like 250 people participating. So it's, it's you know, becoming infectious in a good way of, uh, of this program and the four pillars of our health and wellness program. But Rich, it really started with you. I mean, what would you say to- Oh, oh somebody? yeah, no, I, uh, what it started with me is, look, I've been, I've been going to the gym for- probably, you know, utilizing a, a trainer in like a semi-private group setting, like three or four friends of mine, probably over 10 to 15 years um, off and on. Uh, I've had my own bouts with weight loss gain back and forth. Uh, the mental health experience I had, it was almost like over the last 10 or 15 years, I've had all of the issues that now I would like to promote to help everyone figure out we've all got these issues and we joke about, you know, what if we put on, look, I put on 20 pounds during COVID, I'm trying to get them off now because we weren't moving as regularly as we were. I was working out, Rob uh, is my trainer and I was working out on his driveway, but it isn't the same as working out in a gym where you had certain equipment and stuff to do and, you know, weather played a factor in it. So, so we weren't as moving as much and also, you know, uh, stress eating took over. And uh, so you got to get back on nutrition. Um, so, yeah, it, it started with me because I kept promoting it, promoting, promoting, telling the town board we need to do it. Oh, our residents going to be upset that we're focusing on health and wellness. I said, well, anybody wants to argue with me that we're focusing on health and wellness of our employees, it's only going to make them deal with a better employee. The, the employee is going to be happier, functioning better. And Jerry Compatello said it to me best. My productivity is up and I've been able to reduce my overtime expenses for the first six months of, uh, of 2022. And I said, Jerry, you've sold me because, and she said, the, the women are happier. They're like, yeah, we'll give up a couple of bucks for the fact that you've given us this roadmap for how to make ourselves healthier. So I, I'm, and I'm promoting it with, with other town supervisors. In fact, I spoke to um, Dan Leveler, who is the president of AME. Uh, they represent the, all of the county employees, non-law enforcement or college right. employees. And um, 
Dan loves it. They're self-insured. And I mentioned it to Noel DiGiralmo. He's the other co-chair of the employee uh, health uh, committee uh, for the county. And they love it. I'm going to do a present. We're going to do a presentation with them shortly uh, because I said there's nothing wrong with introducing it on a much larger scale, which would be the county employees. That's they've got, you know, probably close to 18,000 between the cops and the sheriff and all the regular employees and the college. Uh, and I've promoted it to my fellow town supervisors and they're kind of like, what are you doing over there? And, you know, they've heard little things here and there. So we're going to go out. I think we made a presentation to Brookhaven town. Ed Romaine is very interested in it. Angie Carpenter. So we're going to start again, promoting it because I, I think it will help the public by us having a better uh, and a healthier and, and more well employee uh, pro providing services and programs. Yeah, Rich. And, you know, you are really the role model of resiliency. And, you know, if it wasn't from your, for your leadership and your ambassadorship uh, and your kind endorsement um, of this important uh, tending to our physical and mental health and, and the connectedness between all of it, um, it wouldn't be possible. So I, I want to thank you. I want to thank Dr. Mike. Um, for, and the Long Island Association for giving us the opportunity to present what we think, um, you know, resiliency in the workplace should really look like. And um, if any of you are interested as a member benefit for the Long Island Association, we would offer a discounted resiliency assessment uh, like the one I just went over and a recommended customized curriculum for your business. My email is below and so is my cell. Dr. Mike would be more than happy as well and joining me with the full um, assessment uh, from a complete eclectic biological and psychological assessment. So I wanna thank you all for this time and please remember that Mental Health Awareness Month, although it's a month, it should be a life. And I wish you nothing but the best and that you stay resilient. Rich, Dr. Mike, anything you'd like to add? Uh, no, and, and just I, I, I'm more than happy to make myself available too. So if you have anybody, Rob or, or Dr. Mike, uh, uh, let me know. Happy to talk to them about our experiences at the town of Babylon. Thank you. Thank very you both good. very much. And have Thank a great day. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs>